Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Lexia Weaver. I'm a coastal scientist at the North Carolina Coastal Federation. The Coastal Federation is a nonprofit organization uh, focused exclusively on protecting and restoring the coast of North Carolina, and we do that through environmental education, advocacy, and through restoration and conservation projects. Um, in addition to living shoreline work, I also work on large-scale wetland restoration projects. I also work on stormwater runoff retrofit projects um, and oyster restoration as well. So today, I'll be talking to you about how to plant the salt marsh portion of your living shoreline. So whether you are planting in a natural shoreline that has no structures in front of it, or whether you're planting behind a sill, like this oyster shell bag sill um, that we have here at Jones Island. <clears throat> so today we'll be talking about the types of salt marsh grasses and the species that you will be planting typically in your living shoreline, where you can get them, how much they cost, when and where to plant them along your shoreline, how to plant them as well, um, and then I'll talk to you about different ways that you can use um, recycled oyster shells for the construction of living shorelines, and you've heard about, uh, some of this may be a little bit repetitive from what you've heard about today, but that way it gets ingrained, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also, before I begin, I know it, you know, we've convinced you of this, but in case we haven't convinced you yet, I just wanted to talk about the importance of living shorelines and salt marsh grass in reducing that wave energy and protecting your shorelines from erosion. And to do this, I'll show you an example. This is a bulkhead um, at Hammocks Beach State Park in Swansboro. It was replaced by a living shoreline in 2001. Um, so what happens is when those waves come in, they're going to hit that bulkhead, right, from either boat wakes from uh, from boats or, or from wind events, and that wave energy has nowhere to go. So basically, that wave energy, as the water recedes back, it's going to take along with it any sand or any marsh that you have with it, and over time you're going to lose all of that important habitat in your bulkhead. On the other hand, um, when the waves approach a living shoreline, that wave energy is dissipated and absorbed. It trickles through the, um, the riprap, it goes through the marsh, and that wave energy is dissipated and absorbed by the marsh. In addition, at high tide, when that tide comes in and sits over this marsh, all of the particles that are in the water are going to drop to the bottom. And over time, you're going to build up your shoreline, and that will help to prevent erosion and protect your shoreline. The same thing is true, and this is a popular um, slide that, that I, I obviously stole because others of you had it there. Um, I'm not even sure who took this photograph. Spencer, thank you very much. Um, so this is a natural, whoops, let me go back, a natural shoreline. Um, and you can see how, you know, when, when the waves come in, those uh, salt marsh plants help to um, reduce that wave energy. In addition, the extensive salt uh, root system of the salt marsh plugs are going to hold that sand and sediment together to protect your shoreline from erosion. So basically, the, the three types of marsh plant species that you're going to plant for a living shoreline are mostly Spartina alterniflora, or smooth gourd grass, Spartina patens, also known as uh, salt meadow hay, and the Juncus Marianus, the black needle rush. And mostly, um, what you're going to be planting is the Spartina alterniflora. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you where these um, grow relative to the high tide line and relative to the water. Um, the Spartina alterniflora grows closer to the water, below the high tide line, which is indicated by this rack line here. And then you can see the salt meadow hay growing um, behind it. You also see the black needle rush interspersed with the Spartina patents um, up in the higher marsh. So uh, the first thing you need to do to plant your salt marshes is you need to order them. And I always get the question, well, I have a little bit of marsh grass on my property. Can I just like harvest it from here and put it over here? Or my neighbor's got a bunch and we're friends. Can I do that? Well, the answer obviously is no. Um, these marsh plants are um, wetland species. They are wetland plants. They are in areas of environmental concern. And as a result, they are regulated and they are protected by the Coastal Area Management Act, also known as CAMA. So you need to order them from nurseries. And you do this in the fall, probably around September, October, so that the nurseries know that you're going to require a lot of marsh plants. Um, they go out into the field, into natural marshes, and they harvest the seeds from the smooth cord grass um, during this time. Then they keep them in the winter in paper towels in a refrigerator over the winter and then in about February they sow them in these trays in soil um, and put them in a greenhouse and then about April or May they are ready to plant which is when you want to plant your marsh grass. You don't want to do it at any other times of year they won't make it as well. This is the ideal time to plant because that way you capture the growing season of the uh, smooth cord grass. 
You also want to be patient, and you've heard that today. Um, it does take a few years for your marsh grass to get established. Um, so you will want to plant every spring for about two to three years. Um, that is an ideal situation. Sometimes your marsh will take off in the first year, and I'll show you some pictures of that, but sometimes in some other sites they'll take a little bit more. When you um, get your marsh plants, they're going to be delivered in either trays like this um, or sometimes in boxes. And there's pros and cons to the, these delivery methods. Um, if you get them in trays, they're, they're going to take up more room if you order thousands of these. And especially if you don't get them to deliver to your site, you yourself have to deliver them to the site. So um, that is kind of the con. But the pro part is that you don't have to plant them right away. You have a few days. Because they are in trays, you can water them, keep them in the shade, keep them alive a little bit longer. Um, if they're delivered in boxes, they usually come about 250 to a box. So as you can see, they are in there, they're cramped, they're not, you can't easily water them. So these you would have to plant right away. And if you order, I don't know how many are there, but probably 20,000 at a time, um, you definitely either have to have a lot of help or you would want to, you pull them out and put them in trays yourself, which again extends the time. So some lessons learned that I've learned through the years about planting them. Um, sometimes when we get these grasses, um, they come from the nursery really tall. Um, and this is actually not tall. These have already been trimmed. But they come from the nursery really tall and they kind of like flop over. And what you want to do is give them literally a marsh haircut. So you want to take out your garden trimmers and you want to cut them um, so that when you plant them they're sticking up straight. You don't want to plant them and then they'll be like hanging out w when that tide comes in too. Um, if you have a greenhouse um, you can grow these easily yourselves. Um, the nurseries are, you know, I have a few contacts that are more than happy to share their secrets about growing them um, in, the, in a greenhouse. So you can go out and harvest the seeds, you can put them in the refrigerator. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a low cost thing and then you don't have to buy them. <coughs> so where do you get them from? Well, you get them from these nurseries and again, you order them in the fall. Um, these are a couple of the nurseries that grow them in North Carolina. Um, they, for the smooth core grass, they run about 50 cents to 75 cents per plug, depending on whether delivery um, is included or not. Um, the smooth core, the sawmeadow hay and the juncus romerianus, they'll cost a little bit more depending on the nursery. Um, I do have a plant availability list um, in the back. Uh, we just called around um, this week and asked if nurseries um, provided these types of plants and whether or not they did. It's, it's in the back, but you always want to call and confirm their current availability. Yes, these are, these are the ones that you typically um, can get. Sometimes the Junkus plugs are a little bit bigger. These are about one inch plugs, but sometimes the Junkus, you can get two inch plugs, but then your cost goes up to about a dollar, dollar twenty-five. Um, all right, so when and where to plant them? We talked about planting them in the spring, in April and May, for about two to three years. We talked about planting them after the sale, or no, we haven't yet. We want to plant them after the sale has been in place for about a year. So um, you put your sill in first, and then you wait a little bit for that sand and sediment to accumulate behind the sill to plant them. And then not, not only that, but after, when you plant them and the sill is already there, they are going to be protected by that sill during the, these initial um, growing phases. So where do you plant them along a shoreline? Um, so let's say you have an area where there's no other marsh grass species pregnant. So how, uh, there, present. How would I know where to plant them? So I would follow the high tide line, which is kind of right there, but I really would say right about here because it looks like the tide was up through there. That sand still looks moist. So I would plant my smooth cord grass from here down. You also want to be careful not to plant them too far into the water. They're an intertidal species, so you don't want them submerged at, at, at high tide at all times and even at low tide. So there is that sweet spot where you want to plant them. And then you would put your um, salt meadow hay and your black needle rush above the high tide line. So if you have a shoreline that has existing grass, and we, we talked about this today as well, you want to plant in the area where that grass is already growing, where that species is growing, because you know they're going to do well there. So that makes it easy when there's actually growth there already. <clears throat> So let's say you have 300 marsh, pl marsh plugs to plant, which seems like a lot, but really when you put them out here, um, it's not when you, you consider all, you know, an extensive salt marsh grass. So where would you want to put them? Do you want to put them over here, or do you want to cover your entire shoreline? What does everybody think? Yesterday I gave away my answer because I clicked too fast. 
Jason knows. So you would want to put them closer to the existing marsh and closer together. We found that they do a lot better when we do that. Even though you don't cover your entire shoreline, um, maybe you can come back the following year and keep planting and keep planting and keep planting. When we plant them so far apart, they do not do well at all. It's kind of like a safety and numbers thing. Um, there are some scientists from Duke University that are doing some studies on why this is the case and they're looking at the redox potential and it has to do with the aeration and the oxygen of each plant giving each other and helping each other out to survive. Um, so that's something that we've learned through the years. We used to plant them about two feet apart. Now we're planting them a lot closer, six inches to a, even a foot apart. So close together and close to existing grass. So um, now for the best part, um, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience for this, and I've chosen Mr. Paul Donnelly from superintendent at Hammocks Beach State Park, and he has told me he is left-footed, the left-handed left dibbler. Left so he's going to demonstrate how to use um, this dibble bar. This is your planting tool. It costs about $40 from forestry suppliers, so you can get them pretty easily. They're not very expensive. Um, we have tons of them. Welcome to borrow them. Um, so show them how to use, how to make your hole, Paul. Basically, He's done this a lot. <laughs> seek, uh, get your dibbler to go down in the ground about this far, uh, using this bar. Put your foot on here, and you basically just wiggle it back and forth to make you a good hole. Uh, Would you want to do it side to side? Like I tell the kids, no. Uh, Would you want to turn it and make like a hole? You just use that, that yeah, plate. Yeah, that's right. There, the up and down, up and down. So. Thank you, Paul. Thank <laughs> 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 so um, after he makes that hole, so this is what his hole is going to look like. It's going to be like a V-shaped hole about six inches deep. Um, and when you put your plant in, you are going to want to put the plant in very far. It's okay to put some of the green part under, under the um, sediment. You want to get them in there really deep because when that high tide comes in, you don't want them to wash away your 50, 75 cent plugs that you just paid for. Um, so again, very deep. Um, fertilizer is optional. Um, a, a lot of folks like to use it. We use it several, sometimes. Sometimes we don't need to use it. Um, it just depends. If you have a more sandier soil, I would recommend using it. it it's definitely not going to hurt. It is going to help um, promote the growth of your plants. Um, in more marshier, mucky, muddy soils, you may not need it as much. Um, and you just get basically some Osmocote. They come in little pellets, and you put a little bit of pellets in each hole. Um, we also do one plug per hole. Um, a lot of kids cheat that we are volunteers and sometimes I pull out 20 plugs in each hole. Um, but it works better if you, and maybe I should experiment with that, but um, it works better when you put one plug per hole. Um, this is a picture of my son. He was four years old, um, so I'm teaching him early to plant marsh grass. And it just shows how you can plant at high tide. You basically create your hole and then you want to work with a partner because you want that person to have your plug ready to go, put it in the ground before the hole closes up. And it creates a very good suction and your plant is actually, in the, at high tide, planted a little bit better. And the way you test it is you just give it a little tug, make sure that your plants are in there, whether you're planting at high tide or low tide. Um, I always like to show this picture. Um, again, we had a group of um, kids from, from students, I, I can't remember from where, but it was hot, there was bugs. Um, so they were lazy and they basically didn't want to plant and help help <coughs> or learn, right? Um, so they sat down in, in the mud and basically just started planting. Planting really close together. At that point we were planting them a lot further apart. So I'm like, great, I'm going to have to come back, get those, those plugs out and replant them, you know. But I came back and they were the best, the little best plot that I've ever seen. Like, they, it was greener, it was more uh, dense than what we had planted around it. So ever since then, we've been planting them a lot closer. <clears throat> so this just shows that people of all ages can do this, and there is a market for this. I get a lot of phone calls um, from people wanting to help stabilize their shoreline. Um, this could be a business. You could go into the business of planting marsh grass. Um, again, I, I really do think there is a market for this um, for you contractors out there. <clears throat> So I'm just going to show you some before and after photos of showing how successful these plantings have been. Um, these photos were taken at Jones Island in the White Oak River. Um, it's part of Hammocks Beach State Park where Paul works. Um, and you can see this, this shoreline actually only took one year of planting. So we just planted it once. Um, part of the reason um, why it did so well is that we did put in 9,000 plugs in about 250 linear feet of shoreline. So we did plant it very densely. Um, so that's 
one of the reasons why it, it, it did so much better. Um, and this one, actually, we planted even, uh, there was a sill that we put in afterwards, so it was even planted without a sill being in there. So it's a good, good success story. Um, we also did it in front of a bluff. We talked about the bluffs earlier today. Um, so, I mean, so far, so good. It's, it's many years later, it's dense. It hasn't been covered or anything like that by any wash off from the bluff. So it's doing really well. <clears throat> this is on the other side of the island, and this um, marsh took a little bit longer to establish. It was a wider area, so instead of about 30 feet that we planted, this one was about 80 feet wide. Um, so that's what it looked like before, after about three years, and then what it looks like today. Um, so it did, did take a little while, so you just need to be patient. Um, and then these are some before and after photos of the living shoreline at the Carteret Community College that was planted behind the oyster shellback sill, so a before and an after photo, so the plants have taken really well there. <clears throat> so this leads me to the next part of the presentation, which is using recycled oyster shells for your living shoreline construction. Excuse me. So, <laughs> you're fine. Um, so what are recycled oyster shells? They are the shells of oysters that have been harvested and that are consumed by people. Who likes oysters here? Lots of people. I don't like oysters, but lots of people like oysters. So oysters have two shells. There are bivalves. So once you eat the animal inside, the shells are discarded. And we hope that people know to put those shells back into the water. Um, we want them to go and be recycled. Um, and the reason why we do that is because we want them to create new oyster habitat. The oyster larvae that are floating in the water will attach to those oyster shells and create new oysters. It's great fish habitat. And it, once you get your oyster reef established, um, it's also good for the water quality of the estuaries. <clears throat> so there's different ways that you can use oyster shells for uh, living shorelines. You can put them loosely in front of a marsh, like what was done um, here that you'll see later this afternoon. You can put them a little bit offshore and create what uh, we call patch oyster reefs, but also the Division of Marine Fisheries Culture Planting Program also is similar to cr uh, creating these loose pas patch oyster reefs. Um, you can bag them, and I brought a little, this is a mini bag, a little demonstration bag. Um, you can bag them and then put them right up against the marsh as a marsh tow revetment or as an oyster shell bag sill offshore. You can also do a combination of these methods where you have uh, your patch oyster reefs offshore, you can have a sill here, you can have your marsh grass plantings here. Maybe you have a, a marsh toe revetment on this side on um, some other type of, of erosion. But the reason why I'm showing this slide too is that when you have your shoreline, you want to have a master plan for it. Um, you want to kind of plan ahead, and this is lessons learned. Um, instead of you know, trying a technique, oh, it worked, let me try and do it over here because of permitting. Basically, you want to apply for just one permit, show them what you want to do uh, one time. And then that way you don't have to go back and modify your permit, or if your permit expired, you don't have to go back and um, get a new permit. <clears throat> so the first thing you need to do is obtain your oyster shells. Uh, where do we get them from? Um, right now, we are getting them from Quality Seafood. They are in Elizabeth City. They sell them at about $2.85 a bushel, and the majority of that cost is transportation. They have to load them on, you know, pay somebody to load them on the truck and then drive them over here to the coast. Um, I also have a trucker that I work with. His name is Roy Rogers, and he um, gets them from Virginia at $2.48 a bushel, so a little bit further. It just depends um, who you work with. Um, if you're lucky, you can get them donated from Oyster Roast. A lot of the local Rotary Clubs have large Oyster Roasts, so you can have them um, donated which saves you a, a lot of money. And then uh, you can also purchase them maybe from restaurants if you establish a relationship with them, or they can maybe even donate them for you. Um, the Division of Marine Fisheries has an oyster shell <coughs> recycling program. It has been, unfortunately, significantly cut back, but it still exists. They, they are still recycling, um, have some recycling spots, not as um, diverse and, and, and widespread as they used to, but um, that is one way that you can also, and they use their, those shells for their culture planting efforts. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over the construction of the patch oyster reefs and then the oyster shell bag revetments and then the oyster shell bag sills. So for the patch oyster reef construction, typically what is done, this is just one way it can be done, is the oyster shells are delivered, they are placed on dump trucks, um, I mean, I'm sorry, on a barge from dump trucks, and a front end loader is also loaded on the barge, and they use this, the front end loader scoop to basically um, dump the shells into the water, and this does require a major camel permit. 
Um, so sometimes, um, and you saw earlier, the Division of Marine Fisheries, they use a high pressure hose um, to dump the shells off. Um, the IMS at Carrot Island, they just dumped it off the bow of their boat. So there's many ways that this can be done. Again, great market for you contractors out there. Um, I can, yes, definitely guarantee that you will get work doing this. Um, this uh, particular contractor, we, ha we had hired Eric Paik, um, who's a down east contractor, and he had the equipment and the barge to be able to do this. Um, these patch reefs, they don't work in every location. If it's a really high energy site where there's a lot of sediment moving around and you risk getting them buried, you may not want to use this approach. Um, you also have the issue of the boring sponge, which Dr. Niels Lindquist um, and Clamorhead know a lot about. And if you want to learn more, contact them. But the boring sponge basically does that. They bore into the shells. So you don't want to put them in areas where the boring sponge is prevalent, typically higher salinity areas, because you will, it will collapse your reef over time. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> So this is just a, an example of some of the designs that I submitted with the major camera applications, just so you can see what um, kinds of things they expect. Again, these can be hand-drawn, as Daniel mentioned um, a little bit ago. Uh, this was for the ones that we did at Jones Island. They were four, five staggered patch reefs, and it just kind of shows you how um, high you're going to make them, how far apart from each other. Um, you can also do one continuous layer of, of loose oyster shells, but it has been shown that that doesn't yield as much habitat. It does the same for our shoreline protection, but it doesn't yield as much habitat for fish, crabs, and, and oysters as doing them staggered that way. <clears throat> this is another um, plan view that I submitted for a project that we're doing at Beacon Island it, uh, near Ocracoke. So again, it shows you know, how far apart, the water depths. Um, you know, so it's, it's nothing difficult that you can't put together pretty easily. <clears throat> So for the marsh shore revetments and the oyster shell bag seals, the reason why we bag them is, and you've heard this today, is to keep them where we want to put them. We don't want them to scatter like the patch reefs can do um, naturally. So that's the reason why we bag these oyster shells. Um, I get a lot of questions about the plastic. Why are you putting this plastic in the water? It's kind of, you know, defeating the purpose of, you know, with marine pollution and everything. But what happens is that this plastic, eventually the oysters are going to attach here. And you'll want to put these in areas where you have a lot of oyster recruitment. Um, that's really important so that you don't waste this valuable resource. Um, so eventually it'll be covered. And I have some photos of that I'll show you as well, where you won't even see the bags anymore. So it kind of works as the glue to hold the reef together. Um, other people have used different kinds of materials, but they have broken down through time and they didn't give the oysters enough time to attach and create that cemented, glued structure where they don't move. <coughs> so to make the oyster bags, um, we use volunteers, but also, again, this can be done by contractors. We've hired fishermen to make these before, paying them $5 a bag. Um, so it is an industry, I think. It is a good way um, to make some money. Um, so what you do is you use this mesh, and you're going to put it over your PVC tube, like that, like a sock. I'm using your table here. Um, and then you put that PVC tube in the specially designed bagging frames. Um, these take about $100 dollars to make with your wood, the PVC. The oyster bag mesh is about $125 per roll, and I think it's for 300 feet of mesh, something like that. So you can make quite a few bags for each roll, about $125. Um, and then you fill your uh, tube with the oyster shells. And once they're full, you can either use shovels, you can use scoops, buckets. You pull out the PVC tube. And what you're left with, with the weight of the oyster shells, is are your oysters, and then you just tie the other end. So, pretty easy. So we've made thousands, millions, I can't, I lost count <laughs> of how many bags we've made. <clears throat> so, um, we've also talked about using marl today. Um, sometimes we did use marl as that sacrificial bottom layer of these oyster, sh oyster shells because we didn't want to waste the valuable recycled oyster shell. The drawback is it's really hard to work with it with volunteers and kids because it is five times heavier. Um, and not to mention because it's rock and um, heavier, the plastic can, you get start getting holes in your bags and the, the rocks fall all over the place. So, again, contractor work based, I would recommend it for more um, contractors. <clears throat> so it's important where, to make your bags where you're going to deploy them. Um, that way you don't have to transport them and minimize the amount of time um, or the amount of times that you have to move these bags from where they're made to the site. Uh, and we had to do that for Jones Island, it being an island. We had to trailer it to Hammocksby State Park 
and then boat them over to the island. And then we had to stockpile on, on the island um, waiting for the permit. So once we got the permit, we were ready. Those bags were ready to go. As Soon as we got that signature on there, we put, put the bags in the water. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to move on to the, these um, marshhoe revetments first. Um, and these are just some ideal candidates of, of eroding marshes for marshhoe revetments. Um, they have the characteristic um, escarpment. So basically you would put your bags here. Most of these photos were taken, these three were taken at Beacon Island in, at, near Ocracoke, and this one was taken at Jones Island. <coughs> so basically you call your uh, field rep, 808 to 808 here in Moorhead City, and they come out. <laughs> And they, um, you know, tell you whether it's feasible to use these bags on the shoreline. Um, and then you notify your property owners. This can, is done under a general permit. Um, you can go up to 500 feet long for your shoreline. Um, the bags cannot be higher than three feet, and they can't be six inches above the um, height of your marsh soil. So this is an example of a project location map that is submitted with information with, for that general permit. Um, again, just a Google image showing where your, where your site is. Um, this is the plan view where you just indicate to them the yellow line is where I want to put my revetment. This I'm um, going to make it um, 80 some feet, I think this one was, um, and how you're going to build them. And usually these for both oyster sills and marshall revetments, we put them, um, normally they're more rectangular. We put them perpendicular to shoreline. We don't put them parallel to prevent them from rolling. By putting them perpendicular, that kind of prevents that. Um, and the ones that we've done at Jones Island and, and so far Beacon Island, I mean, they've done great. They've, they've survived all these storms that we've had, and they, ha they have not moved. I mean, occasionally you get one or two bags that you need to replace, but for the most part, at least the ones that I've worked on, they, they've done really well. Um, th and then you submit your cross section, which just your sideways view of how you're going to put the bags. Perpendicular shoreline, we usually do three, four layers high um, and three bags out. <coughs> This is what your general permit looks like, um, some of the permit conditions that we already talked about. And this is, shows some photos of how we built them. Again, we use um, a lot of volunteers, um, but you basically start with your first layer, and then you build up from that. Um, and eventually, you, this had a little um, curve in here, so you just follow the shoreline um, with your bags. <clears throat> So I mentioned before, you know, we, we use a lot of volunteers, but we have also hired fishermen to do this work. Um, these particular fishermen, um, they, were, they were hardcore. They um, built these bags. These were, they had larger bagging frames, so these bags were probably twice the size of what we normally work with. They built them at the fisherman's house. The shells got delivered to his house. Um, his, his name is James, James Barry Gaskell. And um, Jean Balance also worked on that project as well. And they both worked to fill these bags up. And then they had to put the bags on their boat and drive, drive them, not drive them, steer them on the boat all the way to uh, um, Beacon Island, about three miles away. So the reason why we paid them $5 was, you know, I think very well justified per bag. <clears throat> this is what some of the revetments look like at Beacon Island today. <clears throat> And then for the sills, this is um, what you would submit. Uh, for our oyster shell bag sills, um, we have mostly done them with CAMA major permits um, because they're, they were offshore. And at the time when we were making these, uh, oyster shells weren't um, considered an acceptable material. Now they, they are for most reasons and in, at most locations. Um, but this is typically the, the cross-section view that I submitted with that, that permit application. This is how. Um, we use that, that first sacrificial layer of marl, and then you build up on that marl. So that's what the first layer would look like. And this is my attempt at a hand drawing. That's why I always use the computer. I'm not an artist. I can't draw very well. Um, so yeah, one of the camo field reps taught me how to make that. So they will help you with your plants. Um, this is uh, an oyster shellback seal that we built at Jones Island. Um, it was built in a day. It was 150 feet long. We had about 65 volunteers. Paul remembers that day. Um, they were recruited by Public Radio East. Um, a lot of them were Marines, which helped a lot. Um, and we built that in one day. Um, these oyster bags are going to serve as a hard surface for that naturally occurring larvae to attach to. Um, over time, this is what um, the reef looks, uh, the oyster sill looks like. All those oysters are going to um, recruit onto the oyster sills, and eventually you don't even see those bags in those pictures. This is probably about a year after they're put in, so you kind of start seeing your juvenile oysters in there. 
<clears throat> and it's also great habitat. You see some uh, fish and some hermit crabs, um, so it's really great habitat. So in terms of cost, I just did some rough estimates just to give you an idea of what it would cost to make a 50 linear foot oyster shell bag marsh toy revetment or an oyster shell bag um, sill. Um, so basically I calculated that you would need about 14 bags per linear foot since we layer them. So that would be about 700 bags for 50 feet and you can correct my math <laughs> if I'm wrong. Um, so it's about 175 bushels. Um, we calculate about four, uh, four bags per bushel is the calculation that we use. Um, and we're gonna aim high here and say that the oysters are gonna cost $3 a bushel because prices always go up, right? So your oyster shells are gonna cost about $525. So let's say you're gonna need about three rolls of this mesh to bag your oyster shells at $125 a roll, so about $375. Your bagging frame is going to be a one-time cost because you can reuse it of about $100. And then labor, if you charge $5 per bag, which I, I think is a little high, but <coughs> because of the circumstances that, you know, they had to travel those bags for such a great distance. But we're going to aim high and just see what the, the most of this cost would be. And then let's say you're going to put in 1,500 pl plugs um, if it's a sill behind your sill. So that's another $750. So your cost will be about $5,000 or about $100 per linear foot. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about with cost. Um, I don't know what the current rate of bulkheads are per foot, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a lot more, if not double, triple that amount. Um, I don't know, you all tell me. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's very cost effective, um, what we think, especially if you can use volunteers um, and especially if you can hire contractors to do this work for you. So that's all I had today, but if you all have any questions, I talk fast. Have you questions? Have you had uh, tried various orientations of the bags instead of just perpendicular to the shore? Um, sometimes in the middle we'll put them parallel where we know we're going to cover them up with another layer, but when we have put them um, parallel, they, they roll. Um, so, yeah, I think what I, I want to try sometimes is maybe, you know, just leaving the inside with like marl bags or just putting loose shell on the inside or, you know, just trying to, we, we just haven't had a chance to try different techniques because um, that middle of your, your reef, the oysters are not going to be able to get to it, to the larvae to attach to. So again, you don't want to waste that shell. Um, so whether we use marl or something for that interior. Any other questions? Any other questions, Carolyn? Lexi, what, what are your thoughts on oyster domes or other kinds of, I guess it's all concrete now and there's some other things coming online. What, what do you think about those? Yes, I like them. I, I really do. I think, oh, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, she said, what do I think about oyster domes and other concrete um, structures to build these things? And I mean, I, I heavily recommend them. They're just uh, probably a little more expensive. CEPI has a great um, structure. They're called ecosystems. They're these concrete fabricated <laughs> structures um, where you can, they're like layers. And I don't know, maybe Jason, you want to explain them a little bit better, but they are, I, I want to try them. Um, they're about 800 a linear foot, $800 a foot, but I think they work really well. They are secured by pilings, so they don't sink. They have like something to keep them from sinking. Um, so I think they would work in really high energy areas. So it's just something that I've been wanting to try, but um, maybe in the future we will. Um, but I think concrete, I mean, re recruits a lot of oysters and as, as well as granite. Um, so. <clears throat> Have you looked at doing any other configurations? I know you mentioned the parallel, but like doing um, like a wedge shape. Instead of just doing a, a, a block. straight line that looks or, so or unnatural. Yeah, yeah, three stack and then, you know, just kind of a, a triangle. I mean, we haven't, but if, if you all have any ideas, I mean, um, we, th these were, this was the first one that I did, is the one that I showed. So I'm a perfectionist, so they're really straight. <laughs> I mean, to the T with that um, uh, meter tape, you know. Um, we did one recently at uh, Trinity Center. Um, we helped them do one, and it follows the shoreline a little bit better, so it's more concave on one spot. It does have a gap. Every 100 feet, you have to have a gap for the permit um, and to allow fish passage and water circulation. 
But I'm sure that, I mean, we are welcome to any ideas you all may have on, on how to build these to minimize the use of oyster shells or to maximize the erosion protection. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking so, even with yeah. the, the marsh tail revetment, instead mm -hmm. of just doing you know, three out and three up, uh -huh. maybe three and then two and like one. Like a pyramid shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah sometimes we do that. Yeah, yeah that we have tried. Um, that way it's not so block-like. Yeah. Um, and we, we did do about an 80-foot long one at Jones Island um, where we kind of did them that way. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. To uh, partially answer that question, a uh, contractor in uh, Currituck Sound went by the theory of building some uh, wooden vertical sills perpendicular to the primary wind direction, uh, which is from southwest, which raises the water level at the same time it gets the biggest waves. And he ended up with some highly unusual scour at each end of the diagonally spaced uh, wooden sills. So I'm not sure what it would do with an oyster reef, but you need to be careful with, uh, with wooden vertical anyway. There will be a quiz out in the field where you all will, um, I will test your planting ability. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is really a question, but more of something that I learned. I was looking for oyster shells to go ahead and try to work on a project. Um, and all of the restaurants that I, because I actually looked at the recycling centers yeah. because some neighbors had recommended that, but they were collecting them for the state, which I thought was um, terrific. So I went ahead and I called the seafood markets and all the restaurants, and they're throwing them away. So I live in New Bern and everybody was throwing them mm -hmm. away. And I, I remember a couple of restaurants were like, well, if you come and maybe we'll have a few and you can take those. So I don't know if it would work, just a suggestion, but I know that teenagers and mm -hmm. people who are just starting off in the environmental field are always looking for a way to contribute. Yep. So if you could maybe have a volunteer group that if you had bins or something mm -hmm. at these restaurants mm -hmm. and then they could collect them and then every week a yes. certain day go and actually you know have this because we had something similar to that in Portland mm -hmm. and um, it was amazing I mean everybody would collect their compost in their little buckets and put it out in front of their house and then these kids from the high That's school great. would come and collect yeah. them I mean it was amazing here they come you know <laughs> taking your little pails and so it seems like if oysters are that scarce, right. then this is something that yes, maybe should be yes, looked into. Yes, and maybe you can give me that list of who you called. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of what we do is outreach, too, because we want to educate people not to throw those oyster shells away. I think it's illegal, right, to take them to a landfill and throw them away. Um, so, right, um, right. I was in shock. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I'll come and get Makes them. And, and these are established restaurants. Right. And I was calling all the way to Moorhead and around. Yeah, so, we'll have to compare yeah. notes. Um, and they're just tossing yeah. them. That's great, because yeah. we get a yeah. lot of high school students that are looking for senior projects. So that yes. would be a wonderful project for them. We get a lot of Eagle Scout projects. Right, that, right. So. and a lot of the recycling centers, people just throw their trash, their big 50-gallon trash mm -hmm. barrels out. So maybe those can be collected for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's, it seems like there's so many resources mm -hmm. that if they're just brought together, then it could be a low-cost operation. So, Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, yeah. and I'll, yeah, we'll have to talk and sure. compare notes so yeah. we can reach out to those yeah. restaurants yeah. for sure. <clears throat> Any other questions for us here? Thank you. Thank you so much.